So at, at the conclusion here of uh, this section, it just, again, give, keep, make sure that your notes have that the tabernacle was indeed intentionally designed and presented to us in Scripture as being a representation of Christ and Christ's ministry. So uh, we just listed these out again. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. He's the bread of life. He petitions the Father in prayer through the authority of the, or our petitioning of the Father in prayer uh, through the authority of Jesus Christ is only done. The wall, the veil of separation between God and man was torn down. And Jesus Christ fulfilled all of the ministry duties of the high priest. So in Exodus, in Leviticus, and uh, mostly, you'll see all of these duties and descriptions of the high priest. And it's very, very, very clear in the book of Hebrews. Again, it's, it's, the whole tabernacle and the high priest is all Hebrews is your um, cross-reference in the New Testament to, to, to look at there. Jesus Christ is presented as the high priest. He's presented as going into the temple. He's presented as offering his blood. Um, and so we're called to be those who are faithful to him. Uh, and, and certainly that generation that fell in the wilderness, the 40 years and they fell in the wilderness, um, is described there in Hebrews chapter 3. And, uh, and going forward, talking about the difference between faithful believers and unfaithful and disobedient unbelievers, um, and how, but how Christ suffered and died to bring believers into God, relationship with the Father. Okay. All right, so that's the, the big Pentateuch. We've just covered, uh, in all of this, we've covered Genesis the stories that we talked about already going forward, I say stories, I really mean narrative and the accounts that are listed there. Exodus is the story of the nation being born, coming out of Egypt and being born and going to the mountain, Mount Sinai, receiving the law, agreeing to the law, coming under that Mosaic or Sinaitic covenant, building the tabernacle, giving instructions by God to go in and take possession of the promised land, but refusing because they saw obstacles and giants and scary things in the land and refused to go in. So then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And the only reason they were wandering is because God said they're all going to die. Now, you know, you can ask the question, well, why didn't God just wipe them out and just bring that next generation in? Well, he, he needed time to develop that next generation. They were under, uh, 20 years or under, and he wanted a whole group of people to come into the land. And if God slaughtered 800,000 people in the wilderness, there wouldn't have been that many left. And as Moses makes claims several times, Lord, if you slaughter all these people in the wilderness, all the surrounding nations are going to think that you're not powerful enough to do the task of bringing them into the land. And so God lets them wander for 40 years, lets that generation die in the wilderness, mostly of natural causes. And then that second group of people, the second generation then enters the promised land. So that closes our overview of the five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, lots of information there that we were just highlighting and, and taking a superficial look at to get us through. The next section here, if you're turning in your notes, is section four, Israel's history. So we're moving from the law, so the Torah, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, the law. We're now moving into what we call the narrative sections of history. And as you're thinking about that or turning in your notes, um, again, so Genesis through Deuteronomy are still considered narrative texts. I hope you get a sense of what that means. It means that God is t giving us an accounting of what took place under certain people's lives and their, um, and their interactions and with him and with other people as history progresses towards where God is moving it towards, okay? Those are all narrative, but there's the 613 laws in the original covenant are interspersed with the narrative. Once we're, well, now that we're done with this section, so, so saying we're, we're moving from Deuteronomy to the book of Joshua, the, the sixth book of the Bible, we are now no longer going to encounter new giving of laws. There's not going to be laws that are going to be given to us in Joshua and the rest. They're going to be reaffirmed, reestablished, part of it, 
But really, Genesis to De- Deuteronomy represents the law, the law of Moses. The next section here are just telling us what's happening to the nation of Israel as they live out their relationship under the law and under the intentioned blessings of God, but sometimes the curses of God because they refuse to obey. So the whole next section here is going from Joshua all the way through um, like Esther, okay? And so uh, all that takes place in these narrative sections uh, are, and it's not entirely chronological, okay? Again, there's going to be Psalms and the books of wisdom and all of these kinds of things. And then the prophetic books that we're going to finish with and the, the Old Testament finishes with itself all of those stories are interspersed with the, the narrative sections that we're looking at. Okay, so we're looking at Joshua through Esther, and Esther is um, dealing with the, the exile or the post-exile kind of time period, like 400 years before Christ, okay? But, so, but the, the, the Old Testament is kind of broken up into the Torah, the law, the books of Moses, five books, and then the narrative, historical books that deal with everything from Joshua to the exile, the post-exile. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then you got the next section of what poetry and wisdom. So you got Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Songs and all of that. And then you get to the prophetic books. And then you've got all the, pro, uh, the, 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 all the prophets writing their prophetic books. And those guys are not at all chronological ordered. I've already given you some indications of that. And the, uh, they're just interspersed. There's, there almost seems to be no true organization as to how or why those books are uh, aligned and arranged the way they are. But we're, we're going to finish this, or this next section here that we're talking about. And the overview and the survey is all of the historical accounts of the nation of Israel from the time of Moses' death to the time of when Scripture essentially goes somewhat silent on uh, the nation of Israel leading to the time of Christ. Okay, so that's what this section is about. Again, the section following will be all the, the wisdom poetry kind of stuff. All right. So we're going to see here under, so Moses... It leads all of the nation in the wilderness. Now, Moses himself, you would think, most of us would think, well, Moses, he's a good guy. He's God's number one in command. Surely he was allowed to go into the promised land as well. But he made a pretty big mistake, and God calls him out from that and says, because you have, and it ultimately deals with striking the rock at the, and, and in order to get water at, at Mirabah, um, he ends up, God says, nope, that's it. You're going to be able to see the promised land that I'm giving to you, but you're never going to enter into it. Um, so Moses, we see the book of uh, Deuteronomy ends with Moses' death. Um, and it says, and a very interesting thing here, and it does seem to have significance down the road, is that God himself buried Moses. So Moses goes up and dies. He can see the promised land on Mount Nebo, but it's, and then he says it died, and it says that God himself buried Moses. And it's interesting, later you get to the book of Jude, and it talks about Michael and Satan arguing over the bones of Moses for some reason. Um, and then we start to wonder whether or not Moses has more to do like one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. Okay, um, but So Moses is dead. And all the way through, this is, this is a wonderful example of leadership transition, we see... Joshua had been Moses' general and kind of right-hand man. Now, Aaron was the, high, was the priest, the high priest. But when it came to actually administrating and functioning, Joshua was clearly Moses' right-hand man. And for some period of time, I don't know we have, you know, how many years we can ascribe to it, but for some period of time, Joshua started to assume more and more duties as the leader of the nation as Moses recognizes his death is coming. And so he's transferring and, tra- and handing off the leadership baton between Moses to Joshua as we make that transition. And then we get, and so now we're looking at the book of Joshua. Okay, so now the, and the whole book of Joshua is designed or, in, or describing the leaving the wilderness 
the 40 years in the wilderness, and entering the promised land, crossing the Jordan River, entering into the promised land, distributing and uh, allocating the land that they were going to conquer to the 12 tribes of Israel. All right. So there are conquests and setbacks. We're going to see what, what's happening here, both under Moses and under Joshua, these, these conquests and setbacks. So um, Moses and Joshua defeat the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17. Um, and these are the descendants of Esau. So Esau and Jacob, the twin brothers, we're seeing the Amalekites get defeated there in Exodus 17. The Canaanites at uh, Hormah are, de- are defeated in Numbers 21, along with the Amorites at Jahaz in Numbers 21, and Og, the king of Bashan, in Numbers 21. And he's, he's the guy that's described as 13 feet tall, effectively. Um, what is it, six cubits in a span or something like that, or five cubits in a span. He's, he's ultimately, when you translate that, he's about 13 feet tall, or at least his bed was. They don't actually tell us how tall he is. They said his bed was basically a little over 13 feet long. So he's a big guy, apparently, or at least he needed a very big bed. And he is described as a giant. Um, and then the Midianite, Midianites are uh, defeated in Numbers 31. So this is all happening as they're traveling in the wilderness, l- working their way towards Joshua taking over and Joshua bringing him into the, into the promised land. Um, and then we see at that point, Joshua is then in charge. God's in charge, but Joshua is the leader, um, and he, we're going to see them go, start working their way into the promised land. So his name literally means Yahweh saves, okay? So Yahweh saves, which is, we would tr- actually say his name was Jesus, if we were using this Anglican version of the name of Jesus, or Joshua, Joshua, Jesus, same name, okay, in Hebrew, So Jesus' name means Yahweh saves. Joshua's name is Yahweh saves. And there's a big correlation there as well because um, if if you, one way we could study the book of Joshua is to just read through the narrative and see the conquest of the land. Another way we could study the book of Joshua is to say, how does this demonstrate another one of these types or models of the conquest of the whole earth at the time of the end? Okay, and there's a whole lot of parallels between Yahweh saves conquering the land of Canaan and Yahweh saves in Jesus Christ coming back and conquering the whole world at the end of time. But we'll leave that for a different study. So they cro- the whole nation then, they go from crossing the, uh, the, the Red Sea and entering into the wilderness of Sinai and wandering for 40 years. Then Joshua has them cross the Jordan River and much the same way. Now, the Jordan River is not the size of the Red Sea by any stretch of the imagination. But in certain seasons, it overflows its banks. And we see the exact same kind of miracle under Joshua as we saw in the Exodus with Moses. Is that God stops the river of Jordan upriver, allows them to cross over on dry land. And when he releases the water back in, it floods over the whole section where they had crossed over. Um, in fact, he has them set up stones in the dry riverbed while they're there. And then he releases the water and the stones are going to be underwater until, the, the, uh, until a season comes along when the waters recede enough to see the, uh, the memorial that he had them set up there in the river. Um, then we also see an, a, uh, a, a, apparently another part of Israel's disobedience was that they hadn't been circumcising their young men in the time in the wilderness. So uh, God instructs Joshua to circumcise all the young males before they cross over and or actually go in and, and uh, defeat the land. Now, uh, from what we know about what happened with the Dinah incident with Simeon and Levi and the... Uh, the um, uh, Lost it. Um, anyway, they uh, when, when they had the, the the their their sister was raped, and they circumcised all the men, and then they used the opportunity to slaughter them. Here, the whole nation of Israel crosses over the Jordan. They're ready to conquer the land of Canaan, and they all spend time healing from their circumcision wounds before they actually engage in a military battle. So. They were in in the flesh. They were left quite vulnerable, but they were under God, and God says, "I will be the one who is your champion." And so, uh, no problem there. 
So then uh, the battle that we know most about probably in the book of Joshua is Jericho and the walls of Jericho falling down after they were encircled seven days and seven times on the seventh day. Um, God just flattened the walls and they went in and defeated all of uh, the um, citizens and inhabitants of Jericho. And then the next story, you start to get the sense that, oh, God, God is going to really do some powerful things. And then we see they're defeated at Ai because Achan had stolen some idols and the whole nation suffered defeat because one man in the congregation stole away some idols um, and, you know, and, uh, and tried to store them for his own treasures. This became a big problem that Joshua had to deal with and, and that prevented them. Uh, several thousand men died and prevented them from being able to go in and conquer the land um, until they dealt with that sin. And then we see after the, they were defeated by AI or, you know, some of their portions of their men were defeated by AI. Then Joshua goes in, defeats AI. Uh, something important does happen there. Um, and that is that later on is there, so they're conquering the land. So the Israelites are in here co- starting to conquer the nations of the land of Canaan, the uh, various ites that live there. And the Gibeonites start to recognize we're going to get defeated. And so they make a deception and they deceive Joshua into thinking that they don't belong, they don't live in the land of Canaan, and they get him to agree to make, an, and the whole people, the whole, all the leaders, to make an agreement that they would not be killed, they would become uh, Israel's servants, and this is, it becomes an issue all along. And so we're going to see the Gibeonites show up again and again and again. In some ways, they're actually allies, they do continue to be allies of Israel, but what we see in the story here is an incomplete conquering of the land that God was planning to give Israel. And because they were incomplete in their conquering of the enemies and conquering the land, Israel suffered many, many, many defeats by their enemies over the centuries. God said, go in. I want you to take out every man, woman, and child in the land, they are being judged by me through you, and you're going to conquer the whole land and inhabit the whole land. And they they didn't do it. They uh, Joshua was a strong leader, but the the overall the tribes of Israel did not do what God ch- charged them to do. And we see the results, the negative results of that throughout the rest of the narrative accounts of Israel's history. So uh, then the Amorites are defeated, and then we see the, the battle that defeats most of them um, in chapter 10 there. The Hazarites uh, and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites all defeated. We see the long day of Joshua where the sun stood still, and they get like 36 hours or something to kill um, and, and, and defeat the enemies. Um, and then Anakim is defeated. And so they, they go through the first section of Joshua is the conquering and the conquest of the land driving out the enemies, at least to some extent, but not to the fullest extent they were called to. And then once they have possession of the land, then they start to divide up the land. Um, And we didn't talk about this yet, but back when Moses was alive, we had two and a half tribes of Israel who didn't want to go all the way into the promised land. They were happy and content on the west side of the Jordan River, and they decide that we just want to live here. We'll go in and help the rest of the tribes conquer the land, but we want to live where we've been living, out here in the wilderness. And that's Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh. And there also ends up establishing Levite cities or Levitical cities um, in, on that western side of the Jordan as well. Or, I'm sorry, eastern side of the Jordan as well. Um, and so it, when you're looking at the tribes and the dispersion and the maps and all of that, you're going to start to see that Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh are very separate from the rest of the nation of Israel. Um, They actually have to cross the river to participate with their brethren in things like temple worship and sacrifice, the sacrificial system that happens over there. And they pretty quickly get disconnected from all of Israel in all of that, at least half of Manasseh and Reuben and Gad. Reuben, probably because uh, they were all part of that tribe that Reuben lost his inheritance on, and so they probably felt disconnected for a long time and all of that. 
Um, not sure about uh, Gad and Manasseh, ha why half the tribe. I'm not sure how they decided to split up in half. But interesting component to the whole division of the land and the conquest. All right, and then the tribes west of the Jordan. Uh, we just see this, the, the second half of the book of Joshua is really just showing and describing the territories of the land that Judah, Ephraim, Manasseh, West, Benjamin, um, and uh, Simeon all get in that side of things. Okay, And then um, you also get Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, Dan, and then again the cities of Levi. So the whole book of Joshua, second half, first half is Conquest, second half is disbursement or allocation of the land to the Levites. And can, coming back to this concept of it being incomplete, so um, they end up retreating in the south, they retreat in the north, and we see um, ultimately as we transition to the next book and the next narrative account, uh, the angel of the Lord, this would be Jesus Christ, expresses his displeasure with Israel's disobedience in chapter 2 of the book of Judges. Meaning, you were called as a nation to go in and take possession of the promised land, and you've left it incomplete, you've left yourself vulnerable, and you will be judged and conquered by your enemies because of your failed obedience or uh, disobedience in serving the Lord and doing what he's called you to. So... To Joshua, yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, the the whole the, the, it's described exactly what God. I don't remember exactly the chapter in Deuteronomy, um, nineteen or something, but it's uh, it's described. It says to Joshua, God says to 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 Moses to tell Joshua, here's the land you're gonna go in, the nations you're gonna conquer. Make sure when you do this that you take out every man, woman, child, and beast in the land. You have to get rid of all of them because leaving even one will bring corruption back into Israel. And so the instructions were clear. Moses had put the mantle of authority and the charge of what God had required of them on him before Moses died. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then we, so that's, that's the, our quick tour of the book of Joshua. Okay. Um, again, military conquests, allocation of the land, leading to a failed description of what takes place or failure to fully conquer and displace the land of its inhabitants. And remember the reason why God wanted to judge them through Israel because they were wicked, sinful, corrupt. They were idol worshipers. And God did not want any of those conditions to be commingled with his people. And they allowed the commingling, and it caused a massive, massive problem for centuries in the nation of Israel. Okay, to leave these people, to leave the land unconquered the way God had instructed them to do so. So that transitions us into the next book of the Bible, the seventh book of the Bible, which is Judges. And Judges is really there to tell us this is the end result of Israel's original disobedience. Because Israel was disobedient, because they didn't conquest, make the conquest of the land, because they didn't take the lives of every man, woman, child, and beast in the land as they were, they were supposed to, we see about 400 years of the end result of their failure and the problems that it caused. So let's, let's look through this. So uh, we're in the period of Judges. And, and, and again, reading the whole book of Judges, you're really not supposed to find heroes. You're really not supposed to find people who are, that you're supposed to look up to and say, boy, they did it right. Uh, because even when they saw some successes, they were still leaving themselves vulnerable to their enemies, and they were still not in complete submission to God all the way through. The book of Judges really starts off, and it starts off bad and ends far, far worse than bad. And it, it just, there's just little blips of, oh, well, that sounds okay. And then lots and lots and lots of gunk associated with the nation of Israel that God had put his name on. He wanted to demonstrate to the world that this is how, when you live for God, you get blessed by God. And he couldn't do it. 
and through all of these different judges and all of these different uh, time periods. So kind of a quick review of the book of Judges is this. Israel, we find, uh, starts off serving Kushan Rishthayim. I don't know what's which Rishthayim. I'm not sure uh, for eight years. So they're they're you know under Joshua they're doing okay, and then they get they become slaves. They're they're back into servitude for eight years under Kushan, um, and then Othniel is used to d- deliver Israel, and um, the forty years of some peace follow. Forty years of peace does not mean forty years of proper living. It just means 40 years where they hadn't been conquered by their enemies. Okay. Um, and then they get conquered by Moab and they serve Moab for 18 years. And then Ehud is used to deliver Israel and then 80 years of peace follows that. But again, we don't see any evidence that they were living right for God. Just they did enough to get delivered. They, they repented enough for God's deliverance to come to them. Uh, Shamgar delivers Israel from the Philistines. So here we kind of see the very first onset of the Philistines in the story. You recognize the Philistines were then the main thorn in the nation of Israel's side for most of the rest of their time until they get conquered by Assyria and Babylon. Uh, Shamgar so as it delivers Israel from the Philistines and then Israel serves Canaan. The people there, the very people they were supposed to conquer, they served Canaan for 20 years. Okay. Um, and then we see the story of Deborah and Barak uh, used to deliver Israel and for 40 years of peace follow. Um, it's great that God used Deborah as a leader and a judge during this time. Um, but the real failure you see is in Barak, who is timid and scared and refusing to lead himself, which is why God had to cho- choose Deborah, because there was no, apparently no other person to choose. And so he cho- chose Deborah, and he gives. And, and Barak is one of the ones who's called to lead and do the military battles. And he's terrified to let anything happen if Deborah doesn't go with him or doesn't isn't part of the process. Um, we think of it in maybe 21st century kind of evaluation and say, "Oh, great, the first woman leader in the scriptures." And it's really, if you, if you were reading this any any time about 200 years ago or earlier, you would have thought. What's wrong with this nation that God couldn't find a single man who could lead this nation? Um, it, I mean, it, it was, it's, it, it's not intended, the communication, just trying to be as unbiased as I can, it's not intended to exalt Deborah. It's intended to shame all the men of Israel. Okay. I have nothing against Deborah. I think it's great. I think she's probably a fantastic leader. Everything described about her is positive in that light. But when, when if you were reading this, as I said, 200 years ago or any time earlier, you would have thought, this is weird. Why? Right? It's just kind of strange. Hello, my wife. Yeah. If you didn't hear that or for the live stream, uh, Kimberly said, you know, one of the things that we should be very, you know, um, praise, should be praiseworthy of Deborah is that she didn't want this role. She didn't seek it. She wasn't out there championing, like, make me a leader in Israel. She took it reluctantly, but God had appointed her to this role because she was the right person in, to do it in the midst of a nation that had no other leaders that was not generating and raising up leaders for the task. So I think I quoted you right, something close. Good. Uh, so anyway, again, I'm not trying to in any way downplay women or any of that kind of stuff, but, but you hear Deborah being championed by women's, in, uh, you know, women's Bible studies and all this kind of stuff is just great, and it's good. But for the men who were supposed to lead, it really is presented as a condemnation of what they weren't doing and why we needed to um, look past all of the un, you know, unwilling and uncapable men and, and choose Deborah, who was clearly capable and doing an awesome job at that. Uh, so then Israel, the, after that, serves Midian for seven years. And this is where we find the story of Gideon. Um, used to deliver Israel for 40 years and peace followed. But So again, Gideon is, is not a, a very brave man. But he's used by God, um, and again, it's it's just it's more about God finding one one kind of gem in the midst of a bunch of chaos and corruption and wickedness 
because the nation at least would turn back and say, we want, you know, we're, we're, now that we've done everything wrong and we're in bondage, can, will God deliver us? And so God would raise up a deliverer, just showing that he's grace, he's grace, and he's got mercy, and he's got love, he's got compassion, but they never learned their lesson. Uh, Abimelech, uh, which the name literally means my, my father is king, conspires to be the king of Israel for three years, a whole story of intrigue and all of that. Um, and then Tola serves Israel as Israel's judge for 23 years. Jair serves as Israel's judge for 20 years, 22 years. Um, and we see uh, another, so they then fall back into uh, slavage and, uh, slavery and bondage. So they serve Ammon and Philistia for 18 years again. Jephthah used to deliver Israel and um, serves for six years as their, their, uh, their judge. It uh, doesn't really talk about the peace time. It just talks about him being the judge for six years. Uh, and the book starts to close out. So Ibzan, Elon, Abdon serve Israel's judges for a total of about 25 years of peace. Then Israel serves Philistia or the Philistines for 40 years. And then we come across Samson who uh, was used to deliver Israel. Again, Samson uh, is a guy with incredible gifting and power and uh, used it one time for actually the purposes that he had the power for at the very last breath of his life to defeat the, the Philistines. Uh, the rest of his time was pretty non, uh, non-impressive in terms of living for God. And then we get to the, the conclusion in the whole book, and this is what we're supposed to really learn. As, uh, what, what, what are we supposed to get out of the book of Judges? Is that everyone did what was right in his own eyes, and that is not a praiseworthy statement. That is the absolute opposite of praiseworthy. This is everyone did it, didn't do what God said was right, and they did what they wanted to do. They were, they were completely wicked. They were completely sinful. They had turned away from God. There was no uh, attempt by the Israelites to do and live right according to the commandment that he had for them. So that's your quick tour of the book of Judges, right? So Joshua transitions to these periods of Judges of about 400 years where you see some things to say, well, God was still active in their, in their nation. The nation itself was pretty deteriorated away from where they had been called to be under the law under Moses 400 years earlier. Okay. So then we transition into our books of, well, you get um, uh, Ruth, but then you get into the establishment of um, of, of, uh, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Okay. And 1st and 2nd Samuel. Now here's, this is really interesting. I just want you to think about it for a moment. There, this is two books. I can't remember now the total number of chapters. Um, something in the neighborhood of 50 chapters that God wrote basically to tell us the story of one man, David. I mean, there's other people involved. You've got Eli, the high priest. You've got, uh, you've got um, Saul, the first king of Israel. But really the whole two book, what we call two books of First and Second Samuel is written to tell us about King David. Um, we don't get that much information on Noah. We don't get that much information on Abraham, on Isaac, on Jacob. We don't even get that much information on Moses, really, because the, the you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy aren't really all that much about, about Moses and his life, all the intricate little details of Moses' life. We see him as the leader of the nation or the, the one who's leading them through the wilderness. This is really interesting to me that God spent that much time on one man's life. And that one man's life, it says that David had a heart of, uh, after God's own heart, but he had a lot of mistakes. He made a lot of mistakes in his life. Um, not the best husband, not the best father, not the best leader, although he's considered the greatest king of Israel, but made so many mistakes. I mean, here's a man who actually, you know, commits adultery and murders the husband of the woman he had adultery with. Um, he, at the end of his life, he, he conducts a census against God's will. Um, and uh, he, I mean, a lot of, it, you know, it's a mixed bag. Really, really good. Really, and some really, really bad. 
I think the, the main point of all of this is, and we'll, we'll talk about the, the book of, books of Samuel here in a second, but I think the main point is when we, st- we then turn to the books of the Psalms and recognize that David wrote maybe 75 to 80% of the Psalms or more, um, we see that we see a man who's always in in an opportunity to share God's love and God's compassion and God's grace in his life. And so David, he's being pursued by his enemies, and he writes a psalm. David is having a great success, and he writes a psalm of praise to God, thanking him for the successes he's got. We see. David making mistakes like Psalm 51 and acknowledging I've done exactly what I just said, committed adultery and I've committed murder and I need to, and he writes a Psalm about it. And we get to see God through the life of a very uh, common man, if you will, in the sense of makes mistakes when he wakes up in the morning, he repents, he confesses, he lives his life, he makes more mistakes, he repents, he confesses, God offers his forgiveness, and it's just a really interesting account. Um, I, I just can't think of, I mean, you go through First and Second Samuel, and you talk about basically these books are about one man, the man David, and then you got First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and it's about we get sometimes a, a king is listed in, in less than two verses. He lived, he did, he either did or didn't do what was right in the sight of God, and he died. And that's all we get about their life. David, we know practically almost like every single intimate detail of everything he ever did. It's really interesting, but it is in, it, one of the components of that is that we see, unlike the rest of the kings of Israel, David again is like a model or a type of Jesus Christ. Not in his failings, but in the fact that he was, had a heart after God. He always desired to seek God. Um, and when confronted with his sins, he did repent. And, and he did have that heart, but... Anyway, so we see a lot of information. Probably, other than Christ, we see more personal details and personal life accounts of David than we do of any other person in Scripture. Really interesting. All right, but beyond that, so the books of uh, the book of First Samuel uh, opens with a description of Eli and 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 then uh, Eli the high priest. And then little baby Samuel, a great little story there about how Samuel came into existence um, and was dedicated to serve the Lord. And here's a man who really did. I mean, from the time he was able, time he was weaned until the time he died, he was in service to God um, as a priest and as a leader and a judge of Israel um, for for his days. We don't really get a lot of information about about Samuel. But it's a, it's a great introduction to the story in the book of First Samuel. So uh, then we see not long after that, uh, after, we, after Samuel is actually an adult and serving as judge, that the people demand of Samuel that God give them a king or he give them a king. Um, God had always intended to give Israel a king, but they demanded it before the time and they paid the price for it. Um, and so... They ultimately demand that God give them a king, and God tells Samuel, "Look, I'll, we're going to I'm going to give you the king, and he's going to be the exact king the people of Israel deserve because they haven't rejected you; they've rejected me, and because they've rejected me, they're going to get a king that is not good for them as a nation. Um, and and Saul was not good for them. He spent basically his entire kingdom trying to kill David." I mean, for the most part, he, he sinned, he failed, and then David is anointed king, and the rest of his time, he's focused on one thing, killing his, the man who would succeed him, um, because God had anointed him as king. Anyway, so Saul is selected and anointed as king of Israel. Uh, we have some rough dates about that, about 1050 to 1010 BC, um, according to some of those accounts. So... Um, this is about 400, 450 years after the time of Moses. Okay, so we're now transitioning through those whole periods of the judges and transitioning into the time period of, of the kings and royalty. Uh, and so you're aware, so we set this up. For the nation of Israel and for then Judah, there was basically two dynasties. There was Saul, 
there was David, and then David's dynasty existed forevermore in the southern kingdom. We're going to see after uh, David's son Solomon that the, the whole tribe split, 10 northern tribes and two southern tribes, but the Davidic dynasty lasted, uh, lasted all the way through, including Christ becoming the King of Kings and Lord of Lords through the Davidic dynasty. Okay. So, um, it was really only two. There's Saul who was from the tribe of Benjamin and David who was from the tribe of Judah. And that tribe was always had a royal aspect to the tribe of David, uh, or to the descendancy of David all the way through. And we would say it still continues today in Christ. So, Interesting component to that. That's very different than all other nations, where where uh, regime changes and uh, and dynasty changes happen all the time. Okay. All right. Uh, so God gives Israel the king in response to the people's demands, and Saul had a couple early minor victories, but he had major major failures in God's eyes, and God calls him out for his failures um, in failing to do what God called him to do. So, because he had these failures, God rejected Saul as king, but he did not remove him. Now, again, you can try to get into the mind and heart of God. Why does he say, I've rejected you from being king, but lets him serve for, for another you know, decades beyond that? God is God. God lets, and in part, I think, again, we get this whole story. If Saul hadn't pursued and tried to kill David for years and years and years we would be robbed of dozens of psalms that David wrote while he was being pursued. Um, and, 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 you know, the enemy of the king, we would miss so much of God's heart in what happened in David's life because David wrote under the Holy Spirit psalms about every one of his experiences out there. Okay. Anyway, so he, uh, he did not remove him. And, but uh, David was anointed by Samuel to be the next king, but it took a long time to develop, and you see that happening in, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, before but before uh, Saul hates David, David defeats Goliath and, and the Philistines. Of course, we, most of us know the story. David takes a, a slingshot, and he right into the forehead of, of Goliath, and he, Goliath falls. And, and from that point on, David is just always viewed as a incredible military executioner. I mean, you just, I mean, I, I mean that in terms of killing people, I mean that he always, every, practically every battle that David engaged in, he had victories in. Um, none of this, like the period of the judges where they would, you know, have some success and they get defeated again and they go back. David pretty much, if he went to battle, he won the battle under the, uh, under the power and authority of God. Okay. Um, so uh, in that time, because of his successes, Saul the king gives David his daughter Michael as a wife. Um, that doesn't work out too well for David in, for the, in the end, but he's, he's married to the king's daughter to start. Um, and then um, God gives Israel a king in response. I'm sorry. So then Saul is persecuted, uh, begins per persecuting David and orders for him to be killed on many occasions. But his own son, Jonathan... Um, is, establishes his loyalties with David, and this is a stuff of legends, uh, and it's true, but it's uh, David and, uh, and Jonathan, their brotherly relationship is just uh, something that people study all the time and talk about how great it was that these two men basically would, are completely willing to give their life one for the other. Either one was willing to give their life for one another. They had this strong, powerful, bonded relationship as brothers, uh, brothers-in-law, if you want to be technical, um, in that. And so David, I mean, sorry, Jonathan actually, you know, uh, sets up David for success at his own fa at his own failure, if you will. Uh, Jonathan would have been in line to be the king of Israel if Saul had died and was able to transfer the crown to David, but he didn't want it. Jonathan knew that Saul, that, that Saul was, had been rejected. He knew that the dynasty wouldn't continue. He knew that God had anointed David as king, and he was willing to support God's role over that of his own father. And so Jonathan is a fantastic um, figure here in the book of Samuel and a, a great friend of David. 
So David, of course, flees and goes on the run from Saul's attempts to kill him for about seven years. And Saul and his sons die in battle. And Saul, um, so Saul's sons die in battle. Saul is kind of mortally wounded in battle, but he ultimately demands that someone kill him. He's, he's going to commit suicide because he doesn't want the, the Philistines to come in and abuse him any further. So um, he, he, gets, he goes in battle, he loses. And so David ultimately um, is intended to be the next king of Israel. Although there's more kind of, you know, power struggles and intrigue that happen here. So he actually is ruler in Hebron over the nation or the tribe of Judah for seven years after that. And then after finally things start to take place, they bring David in and he's appointed or anointed as the ruler over all of Israel for another 33 years. So he ruled as king for 40 years total, seven years only over Judah, and then 33 more years over the whole nation of Israel before he dies. Okay. Uh, he was chosen for this task and this role because he had a heart after God's own heart, as it's described. Um, David, I, I suppose that's David's number one moniker of life is that he was a man after God's own heart. Okay. Every, everything else he did successfully, everything else he did in, in failure, the one thing that we can never take away from David is that he was a man that desired to live for God. He made bad choices and bad decisions at times, but he wanted to live for God and is the only person in Scripture that is described as having a heart after God's own heart. Somehow he was super special in that capacity. So certainly recognize and understand why all of Israel, even to this day, continues to celebrate King David. David is king. So uh, he, as king, he selected Jerusalem, uh, formerly Salem, as his capital city. So the city of David, he's actually got two cities. The city of Jerusalem is referred to as the city of David, but also Bethlehem, which happened to be the city where he was born, of course, in the New Testament is also referred to as the city of David. So the city of his birth and the city of his rule, two different cities. So Bethlehem, the city of David's birth, Jerusalem, the city where he ruled from as king, um, and isn't that, again, interesting as we talk about the typology and models of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, and he is destined to rule over the, over the world from the city of the Jerusalem as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, has the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle of Meeting moved to Jerusalem? He always desired to make that the capital city, the place where all worship of God would take place. Um, God would refu refused to allow him to actually build a permanent temple uh, for him. God didn't want a permanent temple, but he does permit Solomon to build it. He tells David, I'm not going to let you build it. You're a man of blood. You have way too much bloodshed in, in battles and victories and, and war on your hands for me to allow you to build my house. Um, and so he's not, he doesn't allow it. He does allow for Solomon to do it. And interestingly, Solomon basically um, has greater success and greater rule than even David had over everything. But he really had no military battles during his entire reign as king. People just submitted to his authority, all the nations around him. So he had great power and great authority, but it's not really any recorded battles that Solomon was king over or ruled on. Um, let's see. So uh, last, we'll finish off with this. So David, uh, w his reign was basically from about 1003 BC to 970 BC or that time frame. What we see here though under David is he built a strong administration and had a very powerful army and is considered, as I mentioned just now, Israel's greatest king. There's just no king greater than David in Israel's history. We would say Jesus is the greatest king, but for Israel, they would always point to David um, as the, the number one king. He uh, achieved many, many victories for Israel over their enemies, uh, basically set up Solomon, his son, uh, to rule in a, during a great peacetime environment. He established the royal, God established the royal covenant with David, which would allow for Jesus Christ to then assume the throne of David. And it's mentioned in Luke chapter two and other places that Christ is the one who, who is the, the son of David who would rule and reign from his throne, from his authority forevermore. Um, 
God, God refused to allow David to build the temples I mentioned because of his bloodshed. Solomon was allowed to, and David, the major, major negative, as we already mentioned a couple of times, David committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband over all of that. Um, yeah, I should quit. So we'll stop for tonight and uh, pick up with David and the rest of the Kings and Chronicles and all of that. Next week, we'll finish off the narrative and start working into the uh, uh, poetic structures, wisdom and poetry sides of the stuff. So thanks, everybody. See you next week.